Hello, I'm Rachel Babin from the Oncology Network. Welcome to the Oncology Podcast's Experts on Point series. Could ancient salt-loving microbes found only in salt flats herald a new kind of biomedicine? Could their sun-protective antioxidant reactions be harnessed in the development of new treatment options for hard-to-treat cancers like triple-negative breast cancer? Today, I'm sharing a fascinating discussion with Professor Rosa Maria Martinez Espinosa, whose research group recently discovered the potent antioxidant activity of haloarchial carotenoids found in the Santa Pola salt flats just outside of Alicante in Spain. They were amazed by the pigment's effect on breast cancer cell lines. Rosa shares her excitement for further studies in today's podcast. Professor Rosa Maria Martinez Espinosa is a professor of biochemistry and molecular biology and director of the Applied Biochemistry Research Group at the University of Alicante in Spain. And just a reminder that healthcare professionals can access all of our podcasts for free, including our popular series on diagnostics called Beyond the Slide and our brand new series, Supportive Care Matters, hosted by Professor Bogda Coswara. To access these great resources, please join the Oncology Network. Head over to oncologynetwork.com.au to find out more. This is Rachel Babin, and this is the Oncology Podcast. Hola, buenos dias, Rosa. Hello, and welcome to the Oncology Podcast's Experts on Point podcast series. Hello, good morning. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. How are you? I'm fine, thank you, and thank you very much for inviting me. Oh, it's a pleasure. So before we get stuck into it, I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit about yourself, your role at the University of Alicante, and your life in Spain. Okay, so I'm a food professor at the University of Alicante. My main field of knowledge is biochemistry and molecular biology, Focus on microorganisms living in salted palms located in the Mediterranean coast. Apart from this task, as a researcher and a professor, currently I'm the vice president for international relations. And so, in general, I have two main roles one of them more focused on the university management, and the other one more focused on research and teaching. And my life in Spain is absolutely amazing. Spain is an amazing country. I, let, I have to say that because of the people, the weather, the gastronomy, etc. So there are many nice places all over around the world. But Spain, without any kind of doubt, is one of the most beautiful countries. And we are located in the southeast of Spain, quite warm in summertime with nice beaches. Yes, it's a very special place. So we recently covered your work on our Oncology News and Oncology Network websites, and I found it really fascinating. So I'm really happy you're here today to delve into the details for our listeners. So we're going to talk about a new era of biomedicines, and in particular, a pigment produced by halophilic archaea found in the Santa Pola salt flats, which are just outside of Alicante City. So I'm hoping for our audience in Australia and beyond, if you could sort of set the scene for us and describe what the salt flats are like. Yes, for sure. And in fact, in Australia, you have many ecosystems pretty similar to Santa Pola salt flats. You have to imagine that you are at the seaside, close to the beach. We have like small natural swimming pools. So the idea is to fill up these swimming pools, natural swimming pools, with the water. And in summertime, when the temperature increases and because of the effect of the wind, water evaporates. And because of that, the marine salt precipitates. And this is the marine salt that we use for human consumption. So in those ecosystems, What is happening, mainly in summer, is that because of the increase of the salt concentration, microbial populations inhabiting these water bodies 
increase their capacity to grow, proliferate. And this is why in summertime we see the water within this salt flask absolutely red because these microorganisms produce pigments to be protected against the sun radiation. So if you walk along the beach, you see a small salt flask absolutely red because of the proliferation of the microbial communities. Thank you. And what are biomedicines? Okay, well, in general terms, biomedicine is an interesting discipline in which professionals of different areas are working together in order to look for new treatments or new molecules that maybe could be part of the um, new drugs, let's say. So in the case of the um, salt flats, we have realized during the last 10 years that those microorganisms are extreme living beings in terms of chemical reactions and in terms of molecules. They should be adapted to those environments which are quite stressful. So they become fully adapted to those environments thanks to genuine biomolecules produced by them. And by analyzing those biomolecules from a biochemical point of view, we have realized that many of those biomolecules have interesting properties, biological activities that can be useful to design new drugs. And this is why we call them natural molecules with potential applications in biomedicine, because some of them could be part of new drugs, Some of them could be part of new treatments that maybe could replace uh, more aggressive treatments. Mm. This is the way to to be progressing in that field, by using these natural molecules produced by the stromophilic microorganisms. Mm -hmm. And I guess there is an aim that there will be less toxicity from these kind of molecules. Exactly, because they are natural compounds, they are biodegradable, they could be fully bioassimilated, so their toxicity is, well, they are not toxic, in fact. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) Which would be very important when it comes to oncology treatments of the future. So we'll get stuck into the research paper now. So it was recently published in Nature Scientific Reports. Congratulations. Thank you. So what specifically is halophilic archaea and why is its sun protection mechanism important? Yeah, well, regarding to the meaning of halophilic archaea, when we use this term, we are talking about ancient microorganisms. So they are quite close to the origin of life. They are primitive microorganisms. The meaning of allophilic is that they are salt lovers. They need high salt concentrations to live under optimal conditions. So they are part of what we call extremophiles. Extremophiles are living beings requiring extreme life conditions to be alive. And those conditions are toxic for most of the other living beings. So in this particular case, these tiny microorganisms require concentrations of salts around four molar. What does it mean? It means that salt is absolutely precipitated. So only under those conditions, those microorganisms can grow and can replicate easily. Okay. So because they live in salty environments, mainly located in warm global areas, they are exposed to sun radiation at least six or seven months per year. So because sun radiation causes negative impact on the cellular structures, those microorganisms should synthesize molecules to protect the cells against the sun radiation. And in that way, the microorganisms produce pigments to protect their structures. So it's like the sun cream to protect the surface of Mm -hmm. their cells. And those pigments usually show colors between red and orange. 
And, and as I was explaining before, because of these pigments, the salt flats becomes absolutely red in summertime because it is the period of the year in which the temperature is really high, the water body evaporates, salt concentration increases, and because of that, halophilic archaea are really happy living in this ecosystem. It's fantastic. And so from these pigments, you discovered a kind of very potent antioxidant activity, is that right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That is absolutely right. So when we were characterizing the pigment from a chemical point of view, we realized that the molecule was bigger than the average size of many natural pigments. And in terms of chemical structure, this particular pigment has more double bounds than other pigments. So just by looking at the structure, we hypothesized that the pigment should be somehow of high antioxidant activity, right? And the first approach we used to test this antioxidant activity was to grow the allophilic archaeal cells in the lab, in in vitro, and we exposed the cells to really oxidative stress by adding hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is quite oxidant as a chemical compound, so we added the hydrogen peroxide to the cells in order to see responses in the cells. And what we realized was that the cells increased the synthesis of the pigments. So in this preliminary experiment, we demonstrated that the pigments were connected with the potential antioxidant activity for the cells to be alive under stressful conditions. And when we saw those results, we started to think about how this antioxidant activity could be useful in terms of medicine. And this is why we started to to design new experiments to test the antioxidant activity with enzymes, with tumoral cells. And in fact, the first experiment we did was with enzymes. Enzymes involve and the metabolisms of carbohydrates and lipids. This was our first approach. Mm-hmm. And then you moved on to thinking about breast cancer. Yeah, and this was just because at the University of Alicante, there are some colleagues which are working not only at the university, but also at the hospital, and they have high expertise on breast cancer. So after demonstrating the antioxidant activity with the enzymes, we decided to collaborate with these colleagues in order to test the effect of the pigment on breast cancer. And it was absolutely amazing because in the first approach, we designed an easy experiment just with normal mammalian, epithelial mammalian cells mm-hmm. and one only one line of breast cancer cell. And the preliminary results were absolutely amazing. We realized that the antioxidant activity of the big man was able to block the proliferation of the cells. And this is why we decided to expand the experiment by adding more breast cancer lines, Mm -hmm. all of them commercial breast cancer lines. And we repeated the experiment with an overall amount, six different cell lines. And well, the results were even better because for some of the breast cancer cellular lines, we saw and inhibition of the growth. But for many other cell lines, we observe a complete inhibition of the metabolism and a complete inhibition of the cellular growth. So somehow the pigment is able to inhibit the basic metabolism. The size of the cells were also affected. And this is why we decided to continue the study by adding more breast cancer cell lines 
and also include other type of cancer like cellular lines related to liver and the epithelium, etc. So that must have been a, a very happy day in the lab when you saw these incredible results. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, we couldn't believe it. And we asked some colleagues to repeat the experiments in their lab just to be sure that mm-hmm. everything was absolutely reproducible because the results were unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. And so what were the main challenges that you faced? Well, the main challenges, to be honest, are related to their funding. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Their funding in Spain, one of the problems we have in terms of research is the, the funding. So currently we are quite lucky because we got funding from the European Commission to mm-hmm. carry out those experiments and also from the regional government. But this kind of, of fight we have to be always really focused, submitting applications to get the funding, and this is one of the main challenges. And in terms of research, one of the main challenges was to um, optimize the solution in which we should store the pigment to be used in the lab to monitor the effect of the pigment on, on breast cancer lines. So one of the challenges was more related to the funding and the other one was most mainly related to the protocol to be used to keep a stable the pigment in the lab for a long time. Well, I can assure you that many of our Australian listeners and colleagues would have had very similar challenges when it comes to funding, unfortunately. It's always the number one challenge researchers talk about. Though it is um, great that you've managed to progress so far with the funding that you've had. Mm-hmm. Can you briefly explain to us the excelligence technology and the role that that played in this research? Well, this is a quite new technology in which the idea of the aim is to immobilize the cells on a surface in which we reproduce the conditions of the cells within the tissue. Once the cells are absolutely immobilized, we keep the environment stable for a long time without any other kind of manipulation. Compared to other technologies, once the cells are immobilized, the researchers should be manipulating the equipment to keep it stable the conditions. So the advantage of this technology is that once the cells are absolutely mobilized and the conditions of the surroundings are absolutely fixed, the researchers are not manipulating anymore the environment. So the idea is to reproduce 100% the conditions within the tissue for a long time in terms to monitor how the cells are growing, how the cells are suffering metabolic changes because of the treatment we use, okay? So in that case, we mobilize the cells on a surface, we add the pigment, we set up the conditions to keep it stable, the pH, the Mm -hmm. oxygen availability, the nutrients supply, etc. All of this equipment is monitored with a computer and we could be taking parameters quite frequently for a long time. The idea is to reproduce the environment for the cells within the tissue as much as possible. In that context, we could measure the size of the cells, the the diameter, let's say, the volume of the cells, and how some biochemical parameters, the production of uh, radicals, etc., take place along the incubation. Thank you. Now, we touched on the results before, but I wanted to ask you specifically about the sensitivity of the triple negative cell line and why that was particularly important. Yeah, this is important because most of us know this is one of the most complicated tumors to be treated 
the impact in general at the global scale is is significant. So what we realized with our work was that these triple negative cells are particularly sensitive to the pigment. The preliminary results we have revealed that it is because the pigment, the bacterial rubarin, is able to chelate or to attract somehow the oxygen reactive species, which are accumulated at high concentration in this type of cells. So we have to run more experiments to validate this hypothesis, but the preliminary results reveal that the connection between the sensitivity of these cells and the effect of the pigment is because the pigment is able to chelate, to, to attract, to block the rose species produced by those cells. And of course, because of the impact has been amazing, we are going to continue with the research with those triple negative cells. Okay, so you do plan to look further into the triple negative, which is yeah. really, really heartening. Please do keep us updated on that because I think it's fascinating. Are you going to look at other tumor types as well? I think you mentioned liver. Yeah, 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 yeah. And many other uh, colleagues here at the University of Alicante are working now with the liver, also with cells involved in the immunological system. Because in that sense, we think that if we could improve the bioactivity of the immune system, we could run in parallel two strategies. One of them in which the pigment promotes the activity of the immune system. And another strategy, we could use the pigment in a direct way to treat the, the tumoral cells. So the ways to look for a balance not only because of the effect of the pigment on the tumoral cells, but also because of the increase of the activity of the cells involved in the immune system. And do you hope eventually that you'll be doing in human trials? Well, we are planning to do it because, well, as most of you know, we have to follow a sequence mm -hmm. of different steps in this research. We have started with the commercial cell lines. Now the idea is to be involved in a studies in which samples from patients could be used to test the effect to see if it is reproducible or not. Mm -hmm. And if we success, then the idea is to, to involve patients and to run clinical trials to be sure that it's reproducible scalable and finally useful mm -hmm. to, to design a new treatment that maybe could replace chemotherapy or at least could be used in parallel to chemotherapy. Yes, because chemotherapy and other oncology treatments can be particularly grueling for the patients. So are you excited about this kind of role perhaps in parallel or on its own of biomedicines? I think that they could run in parallel. Probably if we go further with our research, we could find more impacts or more collateral effects that could make possible to think in a replacement of the chemotherapy. But with the results we have so far, I think that at least could be running in parallel. We could design a treatment based on the pigment that could maybe decrease the doses using chemotherapy. So in that sense, the collateral damage of the chemotherapy could decrease a little bit because if we replace partially the chemotherapy by the pigment, the, the negative impact on the patient could be lower. This is what we think mm -hmm. right now. But we, we have to run more experiments to be sure about this hypothesis. Of course. But you must be quite excited. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> and this is why we, we are still focused on that. And right now, it's, it's, for us, it's one of our main research lines in, in, in the group. So before we wrap up, are there any resources you'd maybe like to mention or a take-home message, anything you'd like to add? Well, just probably a, a minor message is that we have demonstrated the, 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 the potential anti-tumoral effect of these pigments. 
But for us, it's quite clear that the pigments could have more applications. For instance, in the design of the um, formula in cosmetics, Mm-hmm. Because if we think in, in its natural role, the pigments protect the cells against the sun radiation. So probably the pigment could be part of the creams or the cosmetical products that we use to protect our skin as well. And another field we would like to explore in the next future is the use of these carotenoids to prevent the oxidation of the meals or or the food that is processed somehow to to be stored for a long period of time. We think that because it's highly antioxidative, it could be useful in food processing as well. And this is another research line we are trying to explore now. It's incredible to imagine there's such broad applications from one ancient microorganism that's found in such a specific environment. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah. And as much as we know about these stream ecosystems, more fascinating is because uh, those uh, microorganisms are able to produce an incredible type of molecules that could have or of interest in different industrial sectors. To, to improve the way we produce the products, to improve the way we uh, design the reactions. In fact, many of those microorganisms are able to remove toxic compounds from water and from soils. So another potential they have is the bioremediation, which is the use of microorganisms to remove contaminants from soils or from water. So the more we know about these these microorganisms, the better we realize about the amazing potential they have in different sectors. Now, we will include a link to your paper and some other papers in the show notes. Are there any other resources or websites or anything like that that you'd like to mention? Well, for all of those that are interested on on the pigment or maybe on these primitive microorganisms, I suggest them to look for information related to the um, halophilic group. All files are concentrating different research groups all over the world. Some of them in Australia. Professor Dial Smith is one of the most reputed researchers working on these allophiles, and he is living in Australia. So if you look for Dial Smith at the Google, you will find many nicely works carried out by his team, most of them in Australia, and you could get more information about how these microorganisms could benefit our life in the next future if we incorporate them or they molecules in our processes. Well, thank you so much, Rosa, for taking the time to talk us through this. I think it's really fascinating and it's been a really interesting half an hour. So thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure and it's very important for the researchers to have windows like this one to disseminate, to explain much better what we are doing in the lab. Thank you very much. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you. You've been listening to the Oncology Podcast's Experts on Point series, brought to you by the Oncology Network. To hear more podcast episodes, head over to our Oncology portal at www.oncologynetwork.com.au. Registration is free for healthcare professionals and will give you access to exclusive content including other podcast series like our fantastic diagnostic show, Beyond the Slide, and our brand new series, Supportive Care Matters, hosted by Professor Bogda Kaswara. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please share it with your colleagues. And please contact us if you have exciting research needs to share with our listeners. This is Rachel Babin, and this is the Oncology Podcast. <laughs>